welcome Laura Veynans. I'm, I'm sure I'm not getting it exactly correct, um, but I reached out to Laura on, on Twitter um, given her very interesting work during this time. She's, she's one of those people that you have to follow on Twitter. I, I really learn a lot from her um, and asked if she'd be willing to give a talk on this, this topic that's not only very current um, and, and very interesting, of course, from, I guess, from a clinical and applied population health perspective, but also from a methodological perspective, because I think in these times where prediction models are popping up left and right, we find ourselves asking the question, how good are these things actually, and what's all behind it? So I'm really excited um, that you could join us today. And uh, Laura is an assistant professor of epidemiology at Maastricht University, and she also has an appointment in Belgium in Leuven, if I'm correct. Yes, and uh, I guess other than that, I will <laughs> let her tell a little bit about herself and uh, this work, of course. And without further ado, if you have any questions, oh, this is important. If you have any questions, you can write them to us in the Q&A. Um, there's just a little button at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom webinar that says Q&A, or I think uh, F and A if you're in the German version, Fragen und Antworten. <laughs> and Bob and I will try to pick up on these questions if they are relevant uh, during the talk. We will ask them directly so we kind of don't lose um, an important question about clarification, let's say. And questions that are maybe more general or discussion in nature, we will save to the end for the discussion. And for those of you just joining us, um, a reminder that we, all, we are recording this talk. So if you ask any questions during the talk, those will be visible on the recording. We will then stop the recording for the discussion after. Okay, so without further ado, Bob and I are going to hide ourselves and we will give you the full stage. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. I'm, I'm really happy to be speaking to you uh, today, although it is a bit strange that I'm just talking to my computer and don't see anyone, but I guess that's what the Q&A is for. Um, so I'm going to take you on a journey through uh, what I call the disorderly world of diagnostic and prognostic models for COVID-19. Um, and um, first, I have to acknowledge that I got a lot of help from Maarten van Smede, Ewout Schuit, and Gary Collins um, um, because they provided some of the material in these slides. So thanks for that. And um, yeah, let's just start by thinking on the world we live in today. It's really strange. Um, if you would uh, think back a few months ago, we had no idea this was coming, but today, or actually yesterday, there was more than 6 million confirmed cases and 377,000 deaths globally, really a worldwide pandemic. But back in March, um, that's when my project, this project started. So you see, we were really at the beginning of the um, pandemic then. And I saw a tweet um, and um, that really surprised me because somebody asked um, advice on building a prediction model for COVID-19 patients. Um, I was surprised for two reasons. The first was that I had no clue that there was data out there to build a prediction model. And then I was surprised by the way he asked his questions, which, she, which seemed to suggest that he didn't really have a strong background in clinical prediction modeling. Now, I might be wrong. I don't know this person, but a lot of people picked up on this sentiment as well. And it was a discussion uh, on Twitter on what could go wrong if you do prediction modeling. Um, so lots of questions uh, at that point. And that was on um, March 12th. But I could also see the clinical need for it. If you do it right, if you do a prediction model right, you can really improve care and reduce costs. There have been um, trials or studies studying that. So it can be done, but it needs to be a good model. And in this crisis, you could help allocate your scarce resources. So you could decide who needs to undergo further diagnostic workup. Um, if you have a scarcity of tests, um, you could speed up the uh, 
medical image interpretation, or you can uh, help give a prognosis to patients because in the guidelines in Belgium at least says that deciding who to admit to ICU should be done on prognosis. Um, but how do you get that prognosis? Well, clinical prediction models can do that for you and that could help doctors who are facing moral dilemmas in making these decisions. So I could see, yes, um, this could be useful. Um, so what is out there already? And that was the start of this project. Um, back then, we were, this is the number of uh, published papers on COVID-19, so not just prediction, everything. And you see the steady ink or the, the really um, sharp increase um, that really took off right when we started our systematic review. Um, so we decided to um, look what's out there, uh, what prediction models are there, and what is their quality? Are they built in a good way? And um, if we get a crisis here, which wasn't clear at that um, moment yet, is there anything we can use in Europe? Is there anything that we can offer to um, medical staff to assist them in this crisis? So that was what we started out with. And I had a lot of help from all these uh, uh, amazing people doing that. But we were not the only ones. So uh, next, there was um, a rapid increase in the number of patients, but also a rapid increase in the number of papers and also a rapid increase in the number of systematic reviews. So there are about 1,000 systematic reviews on Prospero and already 137 published in PubMed. So what's different between our review and, and a lot of the other reviews that are done, um, we don't only look at the published material. So um, in this graph, you can see that um, the, the, the blue bars are um, preprint only. So you can see that the, the most of the studies that are out there are preprints. So it was really crucial to, um, as uh, scientific research was being done and, and it was clear that traditional publishing is, is not keeping up, uh, with the speed of, of scientific research that's been, be, being done, that we really need to incorporate these preprints. So we, we include them in, their, in our analysis and in our review as well. Um, the scope of our review was that we wanted to have prediction models for diagnosing COVID-19, um, for prognosis of patients who have COVID-19, and also models that can help detect people in the general population. Um, and we are looking at the clinical prediction models. So that's defined as a tool that can support clinical decision making for individual patients. So you would combine and give appropriate weights to several input variables. Um, for example, image characteristics, signs and symptoms, lab tests, um, age of the patient, sex of the patient, uh, really anything you can think of in, like that. And these are uh, our Bibles. So um, often there's a regression-based model behind it, logistic regression or Cox regression. Um, sometimes you go into more advanced machine learning or artificial intelligence techniques. Um, we've seen a lot of deep learning. Uh, but in the end, the purpose is to have something that's usable in the clinic. So we saw very simple score charts like this, which is a, a early warning score to help diagnose patients. Or something like this, which is a decision tree to um, get a prognosis for patients with COVID-19. Um, sometimes the calculations or the equation behind it, the model behind it is more complex, but if you have a nice web-based implementation, you just fill in, the user can just fill in the variables, click a uh, button, and the, cal the probability of hospital survival um, gets calculated automatically, so very user-friendly. Um, and then on the other end of the extreme are the very complex deep learning methods, which just take um, images as an input, 
um, very complex uh, model behind the scenes. But then also here you can have user-friendly um, implementations and there are actually websites already online in which you can just upload an image and you get a classification um, back. So what did we not do? Um, in the beginning that we published our results, a lot of people thought that we were trying to predict uh, how the disease was spreading or trying to um, say that we were trying to say that the models that um, governments were using to, to support the decisions they made or the policy, policy they rolled out was the wrong one. Well, that was clearly not our uh, um, our, our scope, uh, we, were, we are looking at individual uh, prediction models, not um, epidemiological prediction models. We are also not looking at the risk factor or the prognostic factor finding studies, which look at the potential pro prognostic value of, um, of, of predictors in isolation. Um, and we're also not doing diagnostic accuracy studies. So really multivariable models for individual patients. And it went very quick. So we started um, March 12th, we got the idea, we have to do something with this. Um, the 13th day after we started and the 31st it was published or it was accepted for publication in the BMJ. Um, I've heard that this is the fast, fastest systematic review ever. I'm not sure how, whether that's true or not, but um, I can tell you we, we worked really hard and really quick. Uh, but we had a few factors um, that enabled us to do this, um, starting with this website. So there was already a website online that um, gave an overview of all the uh, papers, all the scientific papers, either published or in preprint for COVID-19. And uh, we, we used that as a basis for our title and abstract screening. Um, we manually ad added archive because that was not in, uh, in that registry <coughs> or in that overview. And we thought uh, maybe some of the more advanced um, machine learning or deep learning papers would be on archive. So we included that manually. And a second um, thing that really helped us do this in such a quick way was that we, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. We just used Probust, which is out there, well-known, um, validated. So we used uh, that for um, risk of bias and charms for data extraction. And there was actually already, uh, uh, Schuit was kind enough to provide us um, a data extraction tool he had made for another systematic review and critical appraisal. So we could modify that for this review. Um, and then we got 14 people involved, 14 people who had experience in this type of research, so risk modeling uh, and or um, systematic reviews of risk models. And um, we uh, had people from Australia, people from Georg Heinze, Belgium, Van van Kalsef, Netherlands, um, with Ewout um, Sterberg and Karel Mons, UK, um, Gary Collins and Richard Raleigh's team. So big international team um, was uh, really working very hard to get this um, done. And we did everything in duplicates. So screening all the titles and abstracts that was done independently by um, me, Marta and Ben van Kalster. And then the data extraction and the risk of bias um, assessment was also done independently by two reviewers because you, you don't want to make a, you don't want this to be subjective. I mean, this really needs to be done well. So two reviewers, um, even though there was a lot of time pressure. On day one, we did a pre-submission inquiry with the BMJ um, because we realized this is going to be a big task. Um, and if there's not an audience for it, then well, there's not really a point in doing this. Um, 
we have to get this message out to the public very fast. So they were very helpful. They were enthusiastic about the idea and we got a fast track peer review process. The peer, peer review process was still very, um, I think we had four different reviewers who all did a very thorough review. And, um, but everybody at the editorial team was very helpful. So I'm very grateful for them because they really made this possible. And then um, the Prisma guidelines and tripod were followed uh, for our reporting. So, um, so I think a key message here is that um, we didn't do anything that we wouldn't do outside of the COVID crisis. We just took a recipe that we all already knew very well and applied that to this health care, this health problem. Um, and um, everything went a little quicker than usually because the, well, there was a sense of urgency from everybody involved. Um, then it got accepted and published and we had to um, find a way to go from a sprint to a marathon because we were asked by the BMJ um, and um, Cochrane uh, Prognosis and Methods Group to keep this up as a living review. And we, we decided that um, yes, that would be worthwhile doing because we knew that there were a lot of um, prediction models from Europe um, still in the making that we hadn't seen. And we could, we are doing that uh, with a lot of help. So we get some technical support from Cochrane. So instead of going through all of the titles manually, we now apply a first round of screening with an AI tool that was trained specifically for that purpose. And it uh, has a very good well, um, we still have to do a lot manually, but we don't want to miss anything. So we, we, we um, chose a threshold that was very sensitive. Um, we have expanded our group. So now we have 39 experienced reviewers um, from uh, well, all over the world, actually. And we are still um, screening and doing data extraction independently by two reviewers and a conflict resolution by a third party um, if there remain any conflicts. So this is a bit the timeline of the project and um, we st the first publication um, was on April 7th. Um, that actually already included a first update, which we did um, after we sent the paper in for peer review, we didn't wait for the results. We immediately updated our search and our analysis, um, but both are published in the first version. Then the first update was published earlier this week. And now um, I'm, I'm, I'm writing the second update, which we hope to um, make available soon. But today I'm already going to give some, some first results from um, that second update. And this is our flow diagram. It looks maybe a little bit uh, small. I don't know if you can see it, but up to now we've screened 14,000 or over 14,000 papers on COVID-19. And from that, we identified 107 studies which propose a diagnostic or prognostic model for COVID-19. Um, actually, it totals to 145 models because some papers uh, propose more than one model. So 107 papers. Um, the majority of them are preprints. Um, the majority of which are in that archive, uh, but already 20 of them have been peer reviewed and published. Uh, and we have stu uh, studies from all over the world, the majority still from Chinese data. Um, a lot of them from international data repositories online as well, uh, or international um, collaborations to collect the data, but some single standard studies from uh, well, all over the world by now. Uh, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, you saw that people were really desperate. So some used simulated data or data sets that didn't even have COVID-19 patients. They just used proxy outcomes. Um, sometimes it's very unclear to figure out where the data came from as well. 
And among those papers, we have four models to de detect people at risk in the general population. Um, 91 diagnosis models, so 60 of them are based on medical images, um, mostly on CT or X-ray, but some also on ultrasound. And nine to classify disease severity. And we have 15 prognosis models, um, a lot of them predicting mortality risk uh, or progression to severe disease. But more and more often, we are seeing composite outcomes of. Um, 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 oh, I'm looking for the word. Um, severe respiratory failure or um, mechanical ventilation, that sort of com composite outcomes we see uh, very often now. Uh, ICU admission, um, yeah. So uh, then the next question would be, how good are these models? Do they work? Um, well, they work very well, according to the researchers. So the AUCs that we see, um, I, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with AUCs or knows how to interpret them. An AUC ranges from 0 0.5, which is um, not better than a random uh, classification, um, to one, which would be perfect. And we saw that many of them are, are, are uh, at least very good or even close to perfect. Um, for the prognosis models, the, the AUC varies, but also the prediction horizon varies. Often it's not really reported um, for which time frame they want to predict an outcome. Um, but if they do, you see that it really varies from predicting what's going to happen within the next day to predict what's going to happen within 30 days, say. Um, but in any case, well, this would be reason for, for optimism, right? I mean, we have all these models, uh, a lot of them already implemented in, in all sorts of tools which are freely accessible online or are ready to be put into software in hospitals, and they seem to work very well. But remember, we did the risk of bias assessment. So we uh, risk of bias, as uh, defined by PROBAST, is the risk that um, there is any flaw or shortcoming in the design or the conduct or the analysis of a study that is likely to distort the predictive performance of the model. So that would mean that the AUCs that we've seen, that they are likely that they may be too optimistic. Um, and it's, uh, it's done, this risk of bias assessment is done by answering signaling questions about the design on four different domains. Um, I will go over them uh, in, a, in a minute, but it starts with the participants, um, the predictors, the outcome and the analysis. Those are the four domains. And if you get a high risk of bias, in at least one of those domains, um, the overall risk of bias is going to be judged as high. Uh, I see I got a question. Yeah, so I think um, somebody asked um, how much, uh, uh, whether we can trust these uh, prediction models with extremely high um, AUCs. And I think we will get into that once we get to the analysis domain of the PROBAS tool. Um, so I'm going, um, the results I'm going to show now, they are from the first published update. So the one that was published on Monday because um, I didn't have time to update my slides. Um, at the end, I'm going to show some results as well from the second update. Um, so to give, so the, the type of questions or, or the questions, that, the things that we are looking for when we do this risk of bias assessment is first, did you use appropriate data sources? 
for example, is it cohort, ideally cohort data if you're, if you're doing a prognostic model, um, a cross-sectional design if you're doing a diagnostic model, and were, were all inclusions and exclusions of participants appropriate? Um, well, it wasn't always the case. So some, some common problems that we saw were that patients were not recruited consecutively. So you don't have an idea whether the patients that were included in the data set are representative of the type of patients that clinicians see during this crisis. Um, the designs are often very unclear um, and often just convenient samples. They use whatever data they can get their hands on. Um, and um, non-representative selection of control patients in sort of case control designs are very common. So what I saw, what we saw multiple times was that um, they had COVID-19 patients from, from one country and they used controls from five years ago in another hospital in another country uh, and used that data or, or combined those data sets um, to, to make a prediction model. Well, you, you, you can try to make it that way, but that would put a lot of burden uh, on you to also prove that it works in a consecutive series of patients today. Um, the predictor domain. So one of the questions was, were the predictors defined and assessed in a similar way for all the participants? Were the predictor assessments made without knowledge of the outcome data? And are all the predictors available at the time the model is intended to be used? Um, one of the common problems here is that in prognosis models, it's not made clear um, when the data was pulled from electronic health records. So sometimes they use the last observation and not the observation at admission, while the purpose of the model was to predict what's going to happen to this patient at the moment he comes to the hospital. So to use the last observation would really inflate your, your, your predictive performance. It's not, a, it doesn't give you a good idea of how well you can predict at the beginning of admission. Um, these are some of the included predictors. Um, this is still from the first round. I didn't get a chance to update it for the last update. Um, but diagnostic models, um, that's usually um, temperature, uh, signs and symptoms, which are, which are defined in very diverse ways in different models. Um, for the prognostic models, that's uh, CT is very important, uh, LDH, sex, CRP, comorbidities. Um, but this usual suspects, and I think we can learn from, from this. If, if these predictors are picked up by multiple models, um, even though these models were not perfect, if they were picked up by multiple models, I think we should not ignore that information. And if you are building a new prediction model, you should look at uh, this list and consider to, to, to use these predictors as candidate predictors in the model that you are building. Then the outcome. Um, questions we looked at was, was the outcome determined appropriately? Was it pre-specified or standardized? Were the predictors excluded from the outcome definition? Um, was the outcome defined in a similar way for everybody? Was it determined without knowledge of the predictor information? And was a time interval appropriate? So what, what could go wrong here? Um, well, sometimes um, your patients were sampled from different centers in different countries, and it was not clear uh, or it was clear that the diagnosis was made in a different way in different centers. If you're then making a diagnostic model, you cannot say that your outcome was determined in the same way in everybody. Um, sometimes predictors were actually part of the outcome definition. So fever was a predictor, but it was also part of their definition of severe COVID-19. 
Uh, and then interesting, some people use proxy outcomes. So I spoke of general population models uh, earlier. There were um, there was a big American study that used Medicare claims data um, from before the COVID-19 crisis, and they modeled um, hospital admission due to severe respiratory infections. So they didn't actually have any COVID-19 data. Um, another one was where they used video images um, and tried to classify based on those video images whether somebody had um, severe uh, respiratory symptoms. Uh, also, not COVID-19, just general uh, uh, respiratory symptoms in general. Then the analysis part. Um, here, these questions are really designed to see uh, whether what you are doing is reasonable in terms of uh, um, the data that you have. Um, is there a good balance there? So was there a reasonable number of the participants with the outcome? That's actually your effective sample size, uh, or that is a big part of your what determines your effective sample size in, in uh, prediction modeling. Um, were the continuous and categorical predictors handled appropriately? Uh, were all enrolled patients included? Were patients with missing data handled appropriately? Was a selection of predictors based on univariable analysis avoided? Because we know that if you do that, that in increases your chance of overfitting, which means that your predictions will be very well on the data that you have, but not on new data. Were the complexities in the data uh, account for appropriately? So if you have censored observations, did you use, for example, a Cox model? Um, were there relevant model performance measures? Um, and were they evaluated appropriately? Were overfitting and optimism accounted for? And do the predictors and their assigned weights in the model correspond to the results from the multivariable analysis? So let's have a look at some of the things they did in terms of analysis. Um, these are the types of modeling uh, approaches that were used. So a lot of them used uh, neural networks. Actually, they used deep learning. Um, and that's due to the large proportion of classifiers based on image, medical images. Um, logistic regression is still very popular, tree-based models. Um, sometimes it's not clear how it was done and few used uh, machine learning approaches such as um, support vector machines, um, Gainier's neighbor ensemble methods. Um, then the sample size, surprisingly, even though uh, we had such a large proportion of very uh, um, data-hungry techniques, uh, a lot of them had small sample sizes. So approximately half had more, less than 100 events. So that means less than 100 people with COVID-19 for diagnostic model or less than 100 people that died when you're doing a prognostic model for mortality. Uh, it was often, all, it was many times, it was also not clear um, how much data they, they had. Uh, for example, with imaging data, the sample size was often reported on the, um, um, the unit of analysis they presented was often the image, but if you have multiple images of the same person, then you cannot really look at that as independent data. You would also have to state the number of patients you included. Um, then if validation was done, um, so if the predictive performance of the model was tested, uh, the majority had test sets with less than uh, 100 events and the reported the recommended value would be so rule of thumb but you would have to have 100 or even 200 events to be able to um, get a reliable estimate of um, how well your model is calibrated for example um, 
Global validation, how did they go about that? So 23 of them used a, a trained test split, which is very inefficient and surprising given that the data sets were already very small. So that's actually very inefficient. You only use part of the data to build your model. So you make a small data set even smaller which increases your chance of overfitting. That means you pick up patterns in your data set. So you, you appear to be doing very well in your data set, but if you test it on independent patients, new patients, your model will not work that well. Um, then you have a small test set left from the trained test set. And then you're actually unlikely um, to detect that overfitting due to that trained test split. So very surprising that they did that. Um, cross-validation would be more efficient. So a lot of them use cross-validation or, um, or, or similar techniques. Uh, part of them used uh, external validation. Um, those external validations were often too small and these external validations suffered very often from the same problems as a development data set in the selection of the patients that were recruited not being representative of what, what one would see in real clinical practice. Um, temporal validation cohorts were done a few times and apparent performance. That means that they just used the same data to test the model as the data that was used to develop the model, which clearly would give you uh, the home advantage. I mean, you, you trained the model to predict that, um, that data perfectly, so you wouldn't expect it to do bad. Um, some even, we also saw prediction models that they were developed as prediction models, they were advertised as prediction models, but they didn't say anything about the predictive performance of that model. Um, so it was sometimes very unclear how well the model did. Um, a big problem with validation was that very few studies look at calibration. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with calibration, but the idea is that if you that the, your predicted probability has to correspond to your observed risk. So ideally this line, which is, this is a calibration plot. So this line should fall on the diagonal. Here you see that patients with a 20% estimated risk of mortality, in re reality, none of them die. So that's a miscalibrated model. Um, it's a bit mean of me to present the results of the, this study because actually it was one of the few that, that, that showed their calibration results. And you see here, this was developed on a Chinese population, then applied in a European population and tested in a uh, European population. You see that your, your, your calibration is off the mark. Your model is not predicting um, the risk very accurately. And it's a bit mean of me to show this because it, did, it wasn't perfectly calibrated, but at least they tested it. While the majority of the publications just show the AUC, the area under the curve, which is excellent, but I'm pretty sure that they would be miscalibrated as well. Missing data is another problem. Um, very unclear what happened with missing data. Um, most studies just don't mention it, uh, so I can only assume that they did a complete case analysis because it's hard to believe that all data was available. Um, and then a special case of missing data or where the complete case analysis is extremely, uh, extremely risky is when you don't have the outcome from everybody. And this was such a common mistake and it surprised, me. Um, it surprised me a lot. So a lot of studies simply excluded patients who had not recovered or died by the end of the study period. And 
they use this data to predict mortality. So that just raises enormous concerns in terms of selection bias. So um, how often did it go wrong? Well, here you see it. Uh, each row is a, is a paper and each you have the participants domain, the predictors domain, the outcome domain, analysis domain. Red is a high risk of bias, orange is unclear, green is a low risk of bias. So these are the diagnostic models and you see, well, a lot of uh, orange and green. This is diagnostic imaging, so uh, usually deep learning on CT scans or x-rays. Uh, again, you see uh, a lot of orange and red. And the prognosis, uh, those were better in terms of participants because, and also in terms of outcome, because the outcome is usually very a hard outcome. It's usually mortality and the participants, uh, they usually use cohort data or, or, or the electronic health records from the hospital and the patients that come in. Um, but still the analysis part, a lot of overfitting. Um, so these, this was the first published update. Um, this is a second update. We had in the participant domain 53 with a high risk of bias, third from the predictors 13 at a high risk of bias, the outcome 34 at a high risk of bias, and the analysis. 108 at a high risk of bias. Um, this is larger than 107, which was the number of studies, because some studies um, proposed multiple models. And in the end, actually, all of the models that we, that we assessed, they had a high risk of bias. Does this automatically mean that they are useless? Um, I don't know. I wouldn't apply them before I had validated them on a, a consecutive series, a representative series of patients um, in the country that I want to apply them in. Um, a lot of the data still comes from China uh, or from different countries uh, all over the world and admission criteria and discharge criteria may differ a lot. Um, so that put cause or that is a likely cause for miscalibration. So reassessing these models before you implement them in a good quality test set, that is crucial. Um, besides risk of bias, there was also poor reporting. Um, as I already said, the study design was often unclear. There was a lack of clear description of the study population. So who, who are you actually making this model for? What patients are you targeting? Very basic characteristics such as age and sex distributions in the data set were often simply not reported. And it was unclear uh, when your model is supposed to be used. So are you, are you predicting mortality at the moment of admission to the hospital? Are you predicting it at the moment they are admitted to the intensive care unit? When? When are you going to use this model? Who are you going to use it in? Simply not stated. Um, what and how many predictors were examined was often very unclear. So they start with a big data set and they just report what ends up in the model. Um, as I said, missing data, sample size, that sort of thing. So um, the literature on COVID-19 prediction models would really be a lot more, um, uh, a lot better or a lot better fit, uh, a lot better fit for, for purpose if they just follow the tripod guidelines. Now, why, why are we doing this and why are we keeping this up um, we know that from, from news, news uh, items or for, from the papers we read uh, that a lot of models are actually already in use uh, in at least a few countries. Um, and if you do it correctly, 
I said this before, a model could improve care and reduce healthcare costs, and it could really help um, if in, when facing COVID-19. Um, but bad prediction model can make things worse. And we know from swine flu pandemic, um, after, after that crisis, uh, people validated SOFA and Apache 2 um, for the patients that came into the hospitals. And, and they saw that the, the predicted risks were, were off target. Um, the mortality was actually lower than what was predicted by those rules. And although these models usually perform very well, have very good AUCs, um, it was a lot worse in this patient population. And we know from this decision analytic theory that if you have a model that has a low AUC or a model that's miscalibrated, actually uh, miscalibration is the thing that can make your model clinically harmful. That means that a model can give you uh, a lower utility or, or worse outcomes than classifying all patients as positive or classifying all patients as negative. So I often heard the argument, well, the models are bad, but it's better than nothing. But that's not true. We know from decision analytic theory that that is not true. Um, are we too pessimistic? Um, well, I have to admit, that the majority of the papers are only available as preprints. So they could, they could get better once they have been peer reviewed. Um, and I really hope that a lot of them do because a lot of the negative assessments were also because they were just unclear about what they did. Um, so yeah, I hope, I hope uh, it improves once it's, it's it's, uh, it's published, but from the studies that we have seen uh, as a preprint and then reassessed after they were published, uh, we see that a lot of flaws remain in the papers also after peer review and publication. Um, and a second limitation, and this is something that is very frustrating, is that there are other models available, um, for example, as web calculators or as proprietary algorithms that don't have a scientific report. Actually, we are judging the people who are, who are at least being transparent about what they did. And a lot of uh, the models that are available, tools that are available, they are not. They are just posted online without any scientific report. You can use them, but there's no documentation. And uh, sometimes, uh, best case scenario, there is like a white paper, but that often is too um, too short or too, that focuses more on the results than actually the methods. We cannot, we cannot assess them. So naturally they fall outside the scope of this review. So in conclusion, the prediction models uh, that we see um, are at the moment still all at high risk of bias. And we think that the reported predictive performance is probably too optimistic. So unfortunately, at this moment, we cannot recommend any of these to be used in clinical practice. So what's, what's in store for us for the future? Well, we are, for the coming months, keeping this living review uh, up and running. And um, we noticed that it's very difficult to get the results out in time. Even MedArchive has a huge delay now. So we are building an own, our own website where we want to post our uh, reviews and also make a searchable database of the models that are out there. So you can uh, search for models for a particular outcome or search for models built by a particular author to see um, how well they did in terms of predictive performance and what our risk of, what our risk of bias assessment is. Um, next, we also have uh, some authors um, uh, 
proposed or, or got into contact with us and we can actually use their data to validate existing models. So we are going to try to validate and fine tune uh, COVID-19 um, related prediction models by bringing all this data from all these different individual studies together. And that can hopefully help us understand also um, whether a model works well in, in diverse healthcare settings. Um, Thomas de Bruin, Valentin de Jong from Utrecht are going to be involved in this as well. So who are we? Um, well, I'm Laura Wijnands. Maarten van Smede was my co-lead in this project, or is my co-lead in this project. And uh, we have Karel Mons and Ben van Kalster um, working very hard on this as well. Uh, René Spijker uh, works at Utrecht, is also from the Cochrane Collaboration. He helps us with all the technical aspects from this, for the systematic review. And then we have Maarten de Vos from Leuven, who is an expert on um, uh, deep learning. And Lisbeth Henkaerts, who is really uh, is also from Leuven. She is um, diagnosing and treating COVID-19 patients every day in clinical practice. So she's one of our advisors together with Mark Bonte from Utrecht. And this is a big team of uh, reviewers that are currently working with us on this. And I'm very grateful for all their hard work. So that's it. Um, I think we can go to questions right now if you have them. Great. So thank you so much. Um, this was this was really eye opening. I mean, even after reading the paper, I, I certainly learned a lot. Um, so just to let you know, we've stopped the recording. And uh, I think uh, I'll turn it over to Bob.